When you open the Bible and read the first chapter and the first verse, which is in Genesis, you're going to find these words. In the beginning, God created heavens, the heavens and the earth. You can read it in any translation, and it will say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And these are among the most important words in the Bible. It tells us that God was at the beginning. God was in the beginning. And that God began the beginning. It tells us that God created the heavens and the earth and all that is in it for his expressed purpose. And as I thought about that, I thought about this word purpose. There's, there's a scripture that says all things were made by him and for him and for his pleasure. So he made it not by accident. He made it on purpose. And purpose is this. It is the original intent for the creation of a thing that was in the mind of the creator. What was the intent? That is the purpose. And I want to take a moment to set the scene for the perspective we need to address the subject I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to tell you what I learned several years ago about purpose. Number one, God is a God of purpose. God is a God of purpose. He had a purpose in mind for everything that was created. Now, before I go much further, let me just throw this in because I, don't, I couldn't find a good place to put it, but I'm going to put it right here. You will find that whatever God does, the devil, Satan, the evil one, has a plan to disrupt it and pervert it. God told Adam not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or he would surely die. Right afterwards, Satan said through the serpent, did God really say that? You will not surely die. God doesn't want you to enjoy yourself. God doesn't want you to make up your own mind about what you think is good for you. That's what the whole argument was about. God knows that when you eat of that, your eyes will be open and you can see how to do your own thing. That's what he was saying. And we've been seeing how to do our own thing ever since. That's why God had to send Jesus Christ. So that you can see that you need to do God's thing instead of your own thing. See, when their eyes was open, they began to walk by sight. Before then, they were walking by faith. Whatever God says, we're going to do that. And when their eyes were open after they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, their eyes was open and they began to walk by sight. Paul came along after salvation and says, for we, the believer, we walk by faith. <laughs> y'all know the scripture? And not, by, and not by sight. We now, who once we get saved, we are walking by what God says and not by what we see, think, or feel. So since the beginning, the devil has been deceiving people. Now, you got people today that doesn't give the devil any credit for what he's doing. They just think it's them. But even people who say that they hate God then have to uh, uh, agree that they know that there is a devil because there can't be a God. You can't say there is a God and there is no devil. So God created everything for a purpose, and nothing in life is without purpose. Everything you see 
has a purpose. There's a purpose for all the plants. There's a purpose for all the animals. There is a purpose for people. So God is the God of purpose. Everything has a purpose, but not every purpose is known. Everything has a purpose, but not every purpose is known. And where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. When you don't know the purpose for a thing. Now, I was thinking about this, and I was sitting in my office, and I was looking for something, and I opened a drawer, and I saw a device in the drawer, and I pulled it out, and I'm like, what is this? And here that device is. I'm going to ask a couple of people to come forward uh, to give an illustration here. Uh, give me a couple of people, Sister Pam and my brother. Come forward. I want you to look at this device, and you all can look at it too. Come on up here. And I want you to t see if you can tell me what this is. I couldn't figure it out, but it was in my house <laughs> and in my drawer. It was mine, but I didn't know what it was. So I want you to take a good look at this device and think about it for a moment and tell me what you think it is. Just think about it for a moment. Don't talk out loud. Uh, there's, some on, there's some pictures on the screen. You all tell me what you, you think about it. Tell me what you think it is. A strobe light. You say a strobe light. It's a device that plays music. A device that play music. Uh, are you a strobe light? <laughs> Didn't say anything. Are you a device that plays music? Yeah, you gotta push it. You gotta push it on. Cut it on. Cut it on. You know he. You know he's from Fifth Ward. <laughs> you cut things on on in Fifth Ward. A strobe light, a device that plays music. So you know what I had to do? I had to go and see this little manual that was with it and look at it and see what it was. Will you look at that and read that and tell me what it is? A car vacuum cleaner. <laughs> It's a car vacuum cleaner. How many of you got it right? Thank you so very much. Now, the point is, if you don't know what it is, you can use it for a strobe light that doesn't work. You can use it, and this is the only music you will hear. So where purpose is not known, you will abnormally use it. Abnormal use is abuse. You can take anything and abnormally use it. You can take Tylenol for a headache and you read the instructions, it says take two every four to six hours. It'll bless you when you take it as directed. But if you take the whole bottle and use it abnormally, it is called drug abuse. In one use, it is medicine. In the other use, it is drug abuse. I was just sitting there and I saw something. You know, the manufacturer puts his name on it and he gives instructions about whatever it is that uh, he manufactures. It tells you, do not place in water. It tells you don't plug it up to the wrong uh, power source. But I was sitting there and I just saw this bottle and it's a, a hand sanitizer. And I looked at it and I said, 
what is it says on it, and it tells you what it is. It says its use is to decrease bacteria on the skin that could cause disease. But right under that, it has warnings for external use only. Now, you can look at that and say, you know, that looked like I could drink that. And you can. But it says, if you do, <laughs> call 911. Because <laughs> you will not last long. So where there is abno- ab- abuse, we abuse things because we do not use them normally. And if you want to know the purpose for a thing, you do not ask the thing. You ask the manufacturer of the thing. So even as people, we shouldn't go around asking other folk what our purpose is. Because they don't know if they haven't talked to the manufacturer. Purpose is only found in the mind of the creator of the thing. And the manufacturer is the only one that have genuine parts. So when it comes to the human, I want to spend some time to look at the making and the purpose for the man and the woman. You go back to the original uh, instructions and the manufacturing place, and we look at it in the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image in our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air over the livestock over all the earth and over the creatures that move along the ground so God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female he created them now notice he said male and female To be made in the image of God means that human beings reflect the glory, the character, and the rule of God in a way that other creatures do not do. The other animals do not reflect, they are not made in the image of God, they do not reflect the glory of God in terms of God's image and the character of God and the rule of God in the way that humans do. So number one, God created man in his own image. And when he says man, he's talking about mankind. He said he made man, male, and a female. He made a male man and a female man. And then verse 28 said, God blessed them and said to them, here's here's how, this is your purpose. Be fruitful and increase in number Fill the earth and subdue it. Your primary purpose for your creation is to be fruitful and to reproduce. We call it procreation. To reproduce so I can have some more offsprings that are made in my image. That's what you are here for. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. God gave that purpose to them in his instruction. He blessed them. He made them. He blessed them. He commanded them. And he equipped them to be fruitful and to increase in number. So being made in the image of God, our creator, means that we humans have the ability to create life. And then verse 31 says, God saw all that he had made and it was very good and it was evening and there was morning and the sixth day. God looked at it and says, that's what I, that's what I made and I made it just right. Everything came out just like I wanted it. He says, it's good. I'm good with the way things came out. I like the design. God said, this is good. This is good. I like that. It's designed just right. 
So that's the manufacturer. He's God. Now we want to look at the man. And God designed the man and the woman to be fruitful, to produce of his own kind. God put the seed in man and then equipped the woman to be the incubator of the seed. The process of fertilization there is called sex. That's the process of that fertilization. Sex is the God-created means by which a man and a woman who are joined together in a covenant marriage bond can produce offspring and enjoy the exclusive relationship and physical intimacy together. God created it. He came up with that. Sex is not bad if it's normally used. The purpose for sex is to carry out the creation mandate of Genesis 1.28. Be fruitful and multiply. You can't do that without sex. God issued this command to a man and a woman whom he created in his image as a physical and relational complement to one another. Husband and wife should fulfill the mandate by uniting in a marriage union that involves sexual intercourse through which sperm and egg unite to form the human embryo. And when that happens, God's kingdom expands through the creation of more image bearers. God said, that's a good idea. That's a good plan. I want more image bearers. I want this to continue. I want to see more increase. I want to see more people that are born that love me and worship me and honor me and give me glory. But there is another important purpose for sex. God made sex for the husband and wife to enjoy one another and to fulfill within the marriage covenant the relational and sexual longings to which he created them. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 20 says, But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall asleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And when the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Somebody said, he said when he saw her, whoa, man. (laughs) And then the Bible says, for this reason, A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. That's in the sexual union. They will become one flesh. And then it says the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. God said, this is the way I planned it. Y'all can just enjoy one another. So the purpose of sex, procreation, the enjoyment in marriage highlights the goodness of God's design and help us identify erroneous views and the mishandling of the gift of sex. Since God created sex, he set the rules for it and the boundaries for it. He's the manufacturer, just like the manufacturer of this hand sanitizer and the manufacturer of this car vacuum cleaner. Before they even put it out in the complete production and get it out in the market, they will give instructions on how to use this. And God gave instructions on how to uh, proceed in the marriage ceremony and in physical intimacy. God does not approve of sex in every context, nor does he approve of every sexual act. I don't know when the last time we heard somebody in church say that. God does not approve of everything everybody do. 
according to the manufacturer's operation manual, the Bible, the only context in which sex is permitted is that of a covenant union between one man and one woman. This, this section over here got it. This section over here is saying, what? <laughs> Let me say that again. According to the manufacturer's operating manual, the only context in which sex is permitted is that of a covenant union between one man and one woman. From the very beginning, the one man and one woman boundaries is seen in the creation of only one woman for Adam. God didn't create uh, three or four women and say, Adam, pick one of these. God did not create another man for Adam and said, uh, you can choose whether you want one of these or whether you want one of these. Furthermore, Adam's biology and Eve's biology are tailor-made for one another. From the chromosomes to the shape of their reproductive organs, there is a harmonious design that God has woven into the creation of the two sexes for the purpose of fitting husband and wife together. There are a lot of things that uh, are, are made and it's precisely designed to fit together for a particular purpose. And without that being fit together, you can't do the purpose for which it was made. I was just looking at that. I have an iPad up here with the keyboard on it. And uh, it's, it's one piece. But you can take them apart. And they are made so they can fit together. Uh, this keyboard does not fit with this. They're not made for each other. I can do all I want to do to try to make it fit, but they don't go together. God says, I made the man and the woman so they can fit and they can produce what should be produced. So Eve was made from Adam and he was, she was made from Adam. Eve was made from Adam and for Adam, perfectly suited to be Adam's counterpart so that together they could find satisfaction for their relational and physical desires. I don't know if you've noticed or not, but men and women are different. Not just physically, but men are different. Men have different temperament and men have different ways of thinking and functioning than women. Or did y'all know that? But God put a balance in there so that we can complement each other. I don't want to be sitting up next to no dude trying to be thinking about everything together. We need that uh, balance. The family needs that nurture, nurturing mother and dueling mother. You know, when the, when the women see a new baby, they say, oh, precious, oh, look at that. And when I see a new baby and I come home and I talk to uh, Jackie and, I, and she said, well, 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 tell me about the baby. I said, well, it was a baby. <laughs> well, who did it look like? I said, I don't know, it looked like a baby. She said, well, i got to ask somebody else. Because the men don't look at all of that. Who do they favor and all of that stuff? The men, the men say, is it working? <laughs> do they have ten toes and ten fingers? Okay, they're good to go. Let's next. As with all things that God created, sex has the ultimate purpose of bringing him glory and the purpose of to use this gift is to glorify God. So when humans use sex in a wrongful manner 
it displeases God and undermines the purpose which he created for sex. Where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. Let's go to the operating manual. The operating manual gives us clear and explicit instructions on the use of this product of the men and women. It also gives us warnings and mentions those things that will void your warranty. So first, let me say this. The Bible manual is for those who believe that God is the creator. The Bible tells us God calls a people to himself to obey him, to honor him, and to be examples for others in the world to see the difference he makes in their lives when they obey his command. God went to Abraham and he said, I'm calling you and I'm going to use you to show that when you serve me and you honor me and your people are obedient to what I say, I'm going to show them how much I can bless you, how much I can take care of you, and they will be jealous of you because I'm going to pour out all my blessings and goodness and favor upon you if you do like I tell you. Peter said this in the first Peter chapter 2 about the believers. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous, wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but you are the people of God. Once you received mercy, but now you have received Mercy. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then he says this to the church. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. He said, listen, dear friends, I'm talking to church folk. He says, we are aliens and strangers in this world. We are different. He says, we need to live good lives among the pagans, and we have a lot of pagans that's in our culture today. Pagans are people that don't believe God, people that don't follow God, people that do not obey God, and people that go their own way instead of going God's way. That's who he's referring to as pagans. So the book of Genesis tells us about the first God-designed sexual relationship between Adam and Eve. It also mentions the abnormal Use. It, gives a, it also gives us the first mention of the abnormal use of sex among humans and how God responded. You can see that in the book of Genesis chapter 19. It's a very lengthy passage in the story, so I'm just going to read it really fast. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way in the morning. No, they answered, we'll just spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom both young and old, surrounded the house. They called out to Lot. Hey, Lot, where are the men who came here tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. What a welcome party. Lot went out to meet them and shut the door behind him. He said, no, my my friends. I don't even know why he called them friends. No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. 
Look, I have two daughters who've never even slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you want to with these. But don't do anything to these men. They have come under my protection. Here's what the crowd said. Get out of our way, they replied. This fellow came here as an alien and now he wants to play the judge. Don't judge me. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness so that they could not find the door. You read the rest of the story. The next day, God destroyed that city with fire and brimstone. The practice of homosexuality was on full display in Sodom. The term that we have today for sodomy is derived from the activity that was prevalent in the town of Sodom. That word has one of its definitions. Sodomy means unnatural penetration. The practice of homosexuality did not begin nor did it end in Sodom. Now, I want you to know there is a God-given desire to engage in sex. Humans have it. Animals have it. That is the desire that leads to procreation or having of offsprings. Without it, species would not exists. But think about this. Humans are the only species that found ways to attempt to fulfill that pleasure in ways that are different than the manufacturer designed it to be used. You don't find any animals in creation that decided that they want to have same-sex relationships. You don't see two dogs, two male dogs looking at each other and saying, well, what do you think? <laughs> so it is only humans who God gave the, the ability to make choices that have come up with the abnormal use of what God created. I didn't get any amens on that. You don't have to say it, but that's the way it is. You find some other species. Now think about this. If every person was in a homosexual relationship purely, humans would cease to exist in a few years. There would be no more people born. And that would be fine with Satan. He would say, there, they can no longer be fruitful and multiply. I won. I got them. But God created everything with the purpose in mind, and you will not find any other species practicing same-sex relationships. The abnormal use of the human body was so prevalent among the nations, God gave special instructions to his people when they were delivered from Egypt. God says, I'm taking you to the land of promise, the land of Canaan. This land was occupied by ungodly people. And so before God's people went to possess the land, God said, wait a minute, Moses. I got some last minute instructions for my people before they go to the land. He said, go back to the manual and be sure that they understand how they should function properly if they're going to continue to receive my blessings. And you can see this in the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, verses 1 through 29. Verse 1 says, the Lord said to Moses, 
speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You see, say that first. I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt. You saw all of those miracles. You saw me open the Red Sea. You saw me give you manna in the wilderness. You saw me fight Pharaoh for you. I'm the same one that's getting ready to tell you what I'm getting ready to tell you now. So let me tell you this. If the Lord is not your God, he's not talking to you. But we are the one that's saying, the Lord is my God. So you got to be sure that are you just talking about it? Or if he is the Lord your God. If everyone who proclaims the Lord as their God would obey the Lord, our culture and our country would change overnight. Let me say that again. If everybody who stands up and says, I just want to just wanna give thanks to my Lord and my Savior. Everybody who says, yeah, that's my God. Yeah, I know him. I know the man upstairs. Yes, I'm a Christian. All of that. If everybody who says that would obey the Lord, our culture would change overnight. Amen. Listen to the message that he commanded Moses to deliver to his people. Verse 3 says, you must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live. Now, for us, that means where you must not do what you used to do before you got saved. That's where you used to live. And then he said, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I'm bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord your God. Now he made it personal. He said it's you and it's your God. Keep my decrees and my laws for the man who obeys them will live by them. I am the Lord. Now, in this passage, there are 18 specific acts of, of a sexual nature that God says we are not to do. Twelve of them have to do with sex between family members. Father and daughter, mother and son, sister and brother, and all of that. You can read it for yourself. Sex was, forbid, was forbidden in those. He says, that's what they're doing where you're going. You don't do that. And you read chapter, verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, verse 9, verse 10, verse 11, verse 12, verse 13, verse 14. They all start with do not. And then you get to verse 22. He says, do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. He's talking to the man. Don't lie with the man. You know what that means? He means don't lie to the man. He means don't you lay with that man like you lay with a woman. He said, that is detestable. Now all the others before him, he just said don't do this. But this one he said, that is detestable. And then he says right after that, and do not have sexual relationships with an animal and defile yourself with it. A woman must not present herself to an animal to have sexual relationships with that. That is perversion. Why would he bring this up? Because that's what they're doing where you're going. And he says, I am the Lord your God. We don't do that. Yeah. 
He, verse 24 says, do not defile yourselves in any of these ways because this is how the nations that I'm going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled. So I punished it for its sin and the land vomited out its inhabitants. The Lord said, you, you want to know why I'm taking the land from the people that's in there and giving it to you? It's because of what they're doing. I can't stand it. It's detestable, and I'm destroying them. And I used to wonder why, if you would read the Old Testament, that God would tell his people to go into a, a, a land and destroy all the people and destroy the animals and the women and the children and the babies. And I said, well, that's so unkind, so unfair. God said they're all diseased from what they've been doing. And if you're going to live there, we, you can't mix with these people because you're going to be diseased as well. But God says in verse 26, but you must keep my decrees and my law. The native born and the aliens living among you must not do any of these detestable things. For all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Let me just put this in here right now. Uh, the United States of America ought to be getting ready to throw up. Don't be surprised. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So what does that look like when the nation vomits. It looked like hurricanes keep coming and tornadoes and heat waves and fires and floods and political upheaval and diseases and viruses. And, okay. You can see it here if you want to and just say, oh Lord, I'm so thankful and not recognize what's going on around you. Of all the sexual acts mentioned, that was the abnormal use. It was homosexuality, and it was called detestable. Here's what God said in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a woman as one lies with, I'm sorry, if a man lies with a man as one lies with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They must be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. Now, I'm not recommending that anyone be put to death for their sexual practices. Under the law of Moses, there was the death penalty for several things. Even cursing out your parents was a death sentence. Adultery. Homosexual activities was a death sentence. But this is what Paul, the apostle, said to the church. Because the church was not under the law, it was under grace. But he says this, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And in Romans chapter 1, he said, for although they knew God, they knew about God, used to go to church, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal men and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurities for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. 
Verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Listen at this. Their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what not ought be done, what ought not be done. They have become filled. See if you recognize any of this. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. And they invent ways of doing evil. They took the alphabet and started stretching them out with L and G and B and T and Q and plus and all of that. How did y'all come up with that? They invent ways. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they do not only continue to do the very thing, but they approve of those who practice them. What we are experiencing in our culture is nothing new. Paul explained how some of the people in the pagan world got to behaving and practicing the things that were wicked and ungodly. He gave that message to the Romans. He gave this message to the church in Corinth because there were people who were attending the church that may have still been practicing immoral and sexual sin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, he says, Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Don't you fool yourself. Neither the sexually immoral or idolaters nor adulterers nor male prostitutes or homosexual offenders nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's the bad news. But he went on with some good news. And he says, and that is what some of you were. Not are. Some of you were. When we come to Jesus Christ, he, he cleans us. He said, but you were washed. But you were sanctified. You were justified by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So let's draw a sharp line right here. There's, there's a new attitude in, towards sin today. People are accepting it. It used to just be black and white, but they got a big gray area where sin is not really what we thought it once was. The church has compromised until it's pitiful. We made up for those in our church. Many churches are made up of those who practice homosexuality and you even got some pastors who say they practice it. You got pastors who are married to same sex. But let me tell you, the lessons of Solomon and Gomorrah is a lesson for this generation. God is not accepting that kind of church. God is not accepting that kind of church. You can have church all you want to and do all you want to do. But don't think God is pleased with it. 
Here's the question today. What is the biblical response to those in our churches and who will come to our churches that may be experiencing same-sex attraction? That's real. Over the last generation, there's been so much promotion and acceptance and normalizing that we have a whole generation that is thinking that that kind of thing is normal and, and they're feeling some kind of way and, and all of that and they want to act on those feelings. So let me tell you, if you, you have those feelings, you're not unique. All of us have feelings. Uh, don't y'all have feelings? Just because we're sitting here don't mean we feel some kind of way. We don't have those feelings. But I heard a pastor say, you know, sometimes I f- I'm married, but I, I feel like getting with some other woman, but I got to put that under subjection. Another, we were in a pastor's meeting talking. Another pastor said, you know what kind of feeling I got? I got a feeling I want to go upside somebody's head. But I can't do that. I can't act on it. You know what, what Paul the apostle says? I have to beat myself daily to bring my flesh under subjection so that I can obey the things of God. Everybody got some issues that we got to deal with and we say, no, I can't function like that. I got to bring that under the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit in my life so that Paul says, don't let sin rule in your mortal body. Don't you let it do that. You may be going through a, a department store and, 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 the, and you go past, past the section and you wouldn't even think about it, but all of a sudden you get an urge to, to snatch something off the table because nobody's around there because that's what you used to do before you got saved. But you can't yield to that, or you, if you do yield to it, they got you on camera. I used to, go, I used to go to a church and I had a guy, was, uh, he was testifying, he said, uh, he was, uh, he, he got, uh, he drank too much and he, he got drunk and he was cutting up and they had to come take him to the, police came and they put him in the ambulance, took him to the hospital. He said, y'all have been proud of me. I was telling them about the goodness of God. He had a church t-shirt on. <laughs> it wasn't our church, but it was <laughs> So that's why I tell our members, when you got our T-shirt on, don't be acting crazy in Walmart. I'm going to tell them you stole that T-shirt. So people have issues. Just because you're saved don't mean you're not struggling with something. People have, have had addiction issues and all kind of things, anger issues. Some have been abused. Some have had all kinds of issues. So how should we respond to people who may be in a same-sex relationship even? How should we respond to the L and the G and the B and the T and the Q? Well, there are two things we should do in response. Number one, we are to genuinely demonstrate the love of God to every person that comes in to the church doors. Every person. There's no, uh, there's no test you got to pass before you can come in through the doors to say you can get in. We should demonstrate the love of God to every person. Every person is valuable to God. Secondly, we ought to point every person to the truth and the commands and the obedience of God's word. We ought to love them and then we ought to teach them what the word of God says about how they should live and how we should live in obedience to God. See, the idea today seems to be you can become a child of God and continue on in sin. God said you can't do that. Paul asked the question, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer was no, God forbid. The idea that you can be 
a born again, genuine Christian and go on in sin is a tremendous, a tremendous mistake. Those in Sodom and Gomorrah would tell you that God was okay with what they were doing. But God went on to destroy the city. So don't think we are old fashioned and have a primitive view of God. The God in Genesis, the God in Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers is the same God we have today. You can argue that Jesus loved and received all the sinners. He sure did. But when he got through with them, he changed them. You can come as you are, but you don't stay as you are when you come to Christ. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The prostitute came to Jesus, but after she came to him, she was no longer in business. A tax collector came to Jesus who cheated people, but he left that job and followed Jesus. And if you come to Jesus Christ, you too will be changed.